Time Chat on Felix Toe Radio with Rob Dunger. And the studio full again today, studio four. It's a whole programme talking about the Suffolk Building Society, as it now is, but we're going back in history. With me is a Luke Little Boy, who's the head of marketing, and Margaret Hancock, who's their archivist. Hello, you two. Thank Hi you. There. Thank you for coming. Now, if it's Building Society... One thing we're not going to be talking about is money, isn't it? <laughs> no. Not, not, for the first time ever, we have someone in from Building Society. We're not going to talk about money. We're talking about your, your history. Not, not your history so much as a society Quite. and how, how, it, how it developed. Look, tell me a bit first about your job, Head of Marketing. That, that is a gorgeous job. <laughs> it certainly is a gorgeous job. It's, uh, it's the job of my dreams, really. So um, one of my earliest memories um, growing up in Suffolk was of walking into a branch of Ipswich Building Society with my with my mother mm. and, and sort of having a passbook in hand and, you know, taking money out or depositing money. And um, I've been a member for, since, for life, really, since, mm. since I was born. And uh, I think my grandmother opened me an account. And I think for a lot of people, you know, that is the way that they first experienced the society. They, um, someone, a parent or grandparents opened them an account. Can you remember how much you put in first of your pocket money? <laughs> how, was, it, was it loads of money? No. So I've, I've, got, I've got my bank book from the Birmingham Municipal Bank mm-hmm. and it, it actually it's still got money in there. It's got £1.19 and sevenpence in there but the bank's <laughs> long gone. But it, 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 was, it was encouraging children to save, wasn't it? Exactly that, yeah. And it certainly encouraged me to, to think like that. I, I certainly, I had a few years in my 20s where uh, I, it was just a complete blur yeah. and I, I've got no, no clue if I was saving or what I was doing but uh, I don't really remember them very well but certainly um, it instilled in me you know that that's that strong sense of saving etc and, and yes you're right fast forward I've done all sorts I've worked at marketing agencies over the years I, I, I've done all sorts of different things and um, I'm really proud and privileged now to, to come to this role at the, at the building society and in fact um, the, my last job was at the agency that rebranded it from Ipswich to Suffolk which is a big brand isn't it I mean Suffolk Building Society but we go back Ipswich Building Society it's got a lot of heritage. Lot of, it is a big brand you're talking about. Yeah, absolutely. Founded in 1849, um, and we'll, we'll come to this in a minute. And, and Margaret will unpack a lot of a lot of this thing around how why we were founded, etc. But the Building Society movement was was found was there to hopefully give ordinary people. It was at the time it was men, because this is pre suffragettes, if you like. Um, but ordinary people the chance to buy enough land to enable them to vote. So um, they were the original disruptors, building societies, and um, it's really interesting when you think founded in 1849, you think about all the things that have happened since then, mm. you know, world wars and mm. the Titanic and all of these things that we predate you know, as a brand, and it's absolutely remarkable, I think. And Margaret, Margaret Hancock, as archivist of a society, it's your job to, to pick out all these gems, isn't it, and to put them into some sort of order. What a glorious job as well. Uh, you, uh, for somebody who's interested in history, this is yeah, a delight for you. It is. It's an, it's an absolute dream of a job like Luke really um, I'd, I've, I've worked for the society as their archivist I'm, I'm not a specialist archivist at oh, all. Oh stop it, <laughs> <laughs> seeing your, she keeps I'm saying not, that but I'm seeing not, your work I'm here well, no. I'd like to see what, what <laughs> how anybody else could do better than you're doing so well, anyway. Initi- initially um, the, the society recognised that it had really historical, um, historically important business records and so initially I started working over 30 years ago mm. um, with the real experts at Suffolk Record Office um, who showed me how they should be packed and how to produce a catalogue of them and an index of them. Um, and this would have been manual then, wouldn't and it? it? was it was a card index system. <laughs> Glorious. Do you remember the card index? Was, yeah. I've still got them in the cupboard. It's nice of you to ask whether <laughs> I remember it, but obvious, <laughs> obviously I do. Yeah. But those card in- yeah. in- indices, they were... I mean, it, it, what a computer does today yeah. is exactly that. It is. It, but you, you, you've you got yeah. the basic knowledge of it. Yeah, then. yeah. It, we started off with a card index under the instruction of the of the real experts mm. um, just to make a proper catalogue of what we'd actually got because mm. nobody really knew at the time. It was all into massive trunks. Well, you would, wouldn't you? You've got this history. You wouldn't yeah. think of it as history. You think of it, no. oh, we'll just, we'll just stuff it away somewhere. Right. Well, we need to yeah. keep it, but it's stuffed away. But the, the good thing is that it was kept. Yeah. Because obviously in the 1960s there was a, a great thing of throwing a lot of that old stuff out, but the society has always realised how important what they've got is. Mm. Um, and and so it was important to have a list of what they'd got so that it would be more easily accessible. But you must have come in and think you 
where the dickens do I start? <laughs> I mean, it, 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 there's a, there was a lot of information. Absolutely, yeah. There was a, there was a lot of stuff, and we can talk a bit later on about exactly what is in it, which mm. will give you. Um, so, more bring of you up an today, idea. What, what is your role today then? My, my role today is to use the the information that's in our archive um, to help broaden the knowledge of the society's history through social media channels and also at special ex- exhibitions and events mm. in the branches. Um, for example, Heritage Open Days, which comes around every September, um, and I usually work in the town centre branch, mm. helping answer queries on that. Um, and most recently, um, we're adding a lot more what I regard as recent items, <laughs> because when you're used to dealing with stuff from the 16th, 17th, 18th and 19th century, something that was produced by the Society in 1985 isn't particularly old to me. It, it, I know it isn't to me, but when you think 85, you think about 10, 15 years ago, I don't know, you? When you I think know. how old it is. Yeah. But it yeah. is, it's, it's true, it's the same it with is. technology. Yeah. Um, we're looking at uh, Felix Stone Museum, they did um, an exhibition of mobile phones. Yep. Mm. Uh, yep. You, you don't think of it, no. but the technology, that is important for us to keep those records it as is. well. It is, yeah. So, so look, let's, let's take us back, because you, you mentioned landowners mm. uh, landowners were important because they were the only people who had to vote they they what they said did and the ordinary people like like us would have, wouldn't have had any say yeah absolutely and you had this interesting thing in the mid 1800s with the industrial revolution happening and um you've got a lot of people working in factories with um not, not particularly good conditions perhaps and uh wanting to improve themselves you've got the the chartist movement uh, coming into play, um, where, where there's a lot of a lot of really vocal people starting to talk about how we should we we should uh, give more people a say in how the country's run it, 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 in order to in order to to improve their their working conditions, etc. Um, so. Um, so, so yeah, that that that's all part of this. There was lots of murmurings going on underneath, wasn't there? There was a bit of unrest, and it was it was a bit of a pickle, uh, and something uh, needed to be done. Absolutely, and that's where you had this whole idea of of the forty shilling uh, freeholders. Mm. So, um, the idea being um, that if if you had a, a building site, was a little bit like a club, if you like, mm. people would um, save into it. Um, they'd buy up plots of land, um, or, or sort of large sections of land. They'd divide them into plots. And then um, people could eventually get a mortgage on them, and then therefore, um, after they paid in enough, and then they'd, they'd therefore be a, a landholder. And I think this idea, looking at Margaret, I said, I think the idea of the forty shilling freeholder was, I think, if the land could get, was it forty shillings a year or something along those lines? That's kind of where yeah. this idea ca- ca- came along. Um, so of course, yes. Then you've got got a, a growing group of people in the. I suppose this is the first time as well that you've got a lower middle class kind mm. of starting to happen mm. as well. So it's a really interesting period of history, and. Um, I really like this idea that of the building societies being the orig- original disruptors, and it was a really big disruptive idea. And um, very forward thinking, wasn't it? Because it wasn't just deru- disrupting for the sake of it; it was planning for now. Mm. What we've got now, it, it's it's all started then. Yeah, absolutely. And it's really interesting to see that Birmingham. A lot was happening in Birmingham, and uh, you had people coming down from Birmingham uh, that, that were noted in that movement, James Taylor, people like that, coming down to Ipswich to talk about it, almost practically stand on a soapbox, if you like, uh, and, and, and get a lot of that excitement going on um, locally. And Ipswich um, really, uh, as a place in Suffolk, um, adopted it wholeheartedly, and you really saw membership start to skyrocket quite early on in, 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 in the mid-1800s. Yeah, so it was just a membership. It's not like, it's not like shareholders or anything. It, it is a membership. It's a, it's a big club you're working for each other. That's it, yeah, kind of to mutual advantage, if you yeah. like. And in, in fact, they had to rethink things because it was so popular. They, the, the original idea was, um, and I, I am always keeping one eye on Margaret because she is the expert on this. Well, feel, but, uh, feel free to jump in, but, uh, Margaret, if we go wrong. What I thought was really interesting, Margaret, as I've learned more and more about the society's history over the years, is, of course, it was so popular that there was this idea of, well, first come, first served. You know, the first people that were first in the door as members will get the first bits of land, the plots of land, mm-hmm. my better word, Margaret, well done. Um, but... Uh, um, what you then found was there was so many people, there was all, you'd start to see membership tail off quite quickly because people thought, well, there's a long waiting list here, why should I bother becoming a member? And then this idea of the ballot came in, which is, um, so, so land was then balloted out to people. All oh, so, right, talk me through this, because I've, I've got a little bit confused on this one. What, what happened with the ballot? What, how did that work? Because well, there was too many people applying for plots. 
Well, as, as Luke said, the, uh, the idea originally was that the, the first people to join would get the first plots of land, and that's exactly what happened. And, and we, we bought our first estate in 1850, mm. only a year after we'd, we'd started collecting funds from our members. So it started off pretty meagerly, didn't it? It did, yeah, it, it did. But then by 1858, so only sort of nine years down the line, mm. we had attracted so many members... Mm that people were thinking, oh, well, I'm never going to get to the top of the list to get a plot of, to get a plot of land. So mm. it's not really the, the incentive mm. that disappeared mm. to actually do that. And that's when we brought in the balloting system. And we have our wonderful mahogany ballot box from 1858. Tell me that about that. And so what happened? You, you actually bought a ballot, did you? You No. no. Um, basically, the society brought the land. Mm. They divided it up into individual plots, just bigger initially just big enough to get the vote yeah. to qualify for the vote um, and then they would say to the members um, we've got 15 plots of land in Felixstowe yeah. um, would you like to the opportunity to, to invest in that mm. um, and the member would fill in a ballot paper um, Print, especially printed ballot papers, and oh, this carried got, on got, until 1930. Some, yeah. This is a this is a sample um, of one that we that we had earlier, and it simply says, "Please put my name in for the ballot on such and such a night." And the, they sent it into the secretary two days before the actual ballot was going to take. To, to take place, and the secretary would get one of their little wooden ballot boards. Describe that to me. <laughs> it's a, it's a, like a, an inch tall, a miniature barrel with a number on it, it isn't is, it? Yeah, and that those are the individual membership numbers. So the secretary would would pull out the appropriate number for the members who wanted the like, opportunity. A bit like a bingo. I was about it, to say. It yeah. is, but we have to be very careful if we're talking to children because they tend to think that they won the plot of land, no. whereas in actual fact it was the right to buy. OK, mm. so um, let's take it through. We've got 100 plots and you've yeah. got, uh, say, 800 of these ballot things. So you go in there and you pull out 100. Uh, yeah. All right, let's say yeah. like, like the, the World Cup final, which yeah. teams yeah. are going through, yeah. and they get the yeah. chance to buy. And they get the chance that to buy. That makes common sense. Sense, isn't yeah, it? yeah, it does. Weren't they clever, our forefathers, to think of something so simple? Absolutely. It is simple, yeah. Absolutely. And uh, I, I love how bold it was. And um, their founding principle, if you, if you bear with me on this, I'll quote it, was because it sounds rather rather grandiose, yeah. was to improve the social position and promote the moral elevation of the unenfranchised population of this country. Mm. So that was um, a rather bold statement to make. But you can see, I think uh, it would be fascinating, I think, to go back to um to parts of the county and, and and towns at that time to actually walk around and see some of the conditions people were living in and mm. um uh, we'll get to some of the estates we've but got. They, but what, what they aimed yeah. for they got didn't they which was amazing i mean mm. it seemed uh, i mean if you went back then you say yeah of course uh, big dreams mm, mm, but mm. Uh, it wasn't dreams that they no. they had a vision yeah they had a vision and they saw it through yeah um there was a a whole group of people um who were really uh, of 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 probably employers, people like the Ransoms um, mm. in Ipswich, who employed vast numbers of, of working people, and they were really keen to help their their workforce mm. um, improve themselves in, in various ways. Because a lot of the big companies had a good social conscience as well. And the, mm. the, Absolutely. Was it, a building, was it called a building society then? It wasn't, was it? It was called something different. It was actually called the... Well, well there were two partner, partner businesses operating in tandem. Yep. Initially, um, there was a sort of trading arm um, called the Ipswich and Suffolk Freehold Land Society. That's a mouthful. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. And, and those are the ones who bought the land, developed the estates and built and balloted both land and then later on houses to mm. members. Um, and the partner organisation working in tandem with that was the Ipswich and Suffolk Permanent Benefit for building society. <laughs> that's why. That's why they employed yeah. you. You can say all these long things. <laughs> um, and 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 that branch of the business provided the mortgages at really carefully considered repayment rates. Mm -hmm. um, so that. So they so they, they, they analysed the risk because obviously it was going yeah. to be a risk lead, but they they yeah. designed the repayment rates around the they, the. There wasn't a mortgage. Mort what were they called? The tenants? No, the landowner. They, the new land. The, the new owner, the new yeah, owner, yeah, the property owner. It, it was very much a, 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 
a means of helping its members to improve themselves, become property owners. And later on, in the early 1900s, they actually advertised in their ballot notices that, that publicised what plots of land or, or right. houses were going to be built. Um, they pointed out that the mortgage repayments were about the same as they would have been paying if they were renting a property of the same sort of size. So it was really encouraging people. I mean, as a marketeer, you must have been nodding at this. This is perfect marketing, wasn't it? Exactly <laughs> to the clients. Perfect. Mm. Shall we have a break for some music? Because a lot of uh, additionals and figures coming in now. You've chosen the music today. Uh, Louis Armstrong, who chose that? Uh, that was me. I, I, I went. Margaret gave me the, the honour of, of making the music pi uh, picks. Okay. This is Sitting in the Sun, and um, I just think it's um, there's a lot of songs about money, but this is a nice, simple one about kind of the simple things in life and uh, and, and, and taking it easy and just counting what, what, what money that you do have and being grateful for it. OK, look at my ghost guest today, uh, Luke Littleboy, who's the head of marketing, and Margaret Hancock, she's the archivist at Suffolk Building Society. And a special programme today talking about what is now the Suffolk Building Society, but going back long before that i've got luke, luke little boy who's the head of marketing and margaret hancock who's the archivist uh, you must have had you got there uh, where was it all kept it was it was it a big room or it, was it boxes and it was it was all kept initially in the down un, underground storage area of our what was our head office branch at the when i started in, upper, at the bottom of brook street upper yeah, street. Upper brook okay street. Yeah. So you went down there. Was it? Was it like? Were you like an explorer going down there? <laughs> Indiana Jones. Yes. Yeah. No, no. Did you have to have a Davy lamp on? Not, with a, a, not, <laughs> not, not quite. One of the one of the existing members of staff yeah. took me down to yeah. show me what was in there, and basically there were two enormous tin trunks, mm. um, amongst other things, and these tin trunks were full of of wrapped up bundles of title deeds to land mm. because basically when the society brought a very large area of land mm. um, that it was going to split up and, and, and allocate to its members or ballot to its members um, all of, because they were, they were only selling small individual plots off mm. um, the, the whole area of land, the title deeds for that were retained by the society so the 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 main part of the or one of the main parts of the archi archive were these over three hundred bundles of titles. So they'd have, they'd have been land. saved not for historical purposes because no. you you would have to save them. It, they wouldn't have thought about you coming along in years no. to time to to document them. No, I think at the I think at the time they were probably a legal requirement yeah. because they were the 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 society's hmm. legal right to have sold the individual plots off. So now, when, when you arrived there, was it excitement yeah. or fear? I mean, as an archivist, that you must think, oh wow, but yeah, well, it was a it big was, job. It was fascin It was fascinating because the reason I was there initially was before I was employed. I was doing some local research on an area that I lived in Ipswich, okay. and I knew that they'd got some documents. Oh. and the only way. Um, they could be found was this one member of staff who went through the tin box yep. and came out with one and said, oh, this is a bundle of title deeds mm. relating to the Rose Hill farm. Okay. Is that going to be any good? And yeah. handed it over and then I opened it up and uh, that's what I've it been must doing have been ever bit, since. It must have been Indiana Jones time, <laughs> uh, like <laughs> Lou said. It must be exciting. Cause he, uh, yeah, it but is. the trouble is, I would get stuck looking at minute details yeah. you you have to take a broader picture yeah. i would i would be saying oh that's he's related so yeah. and so and, and look what was there yeah it's it, it's immensely interesting it is it is interesting and that's when i became employed by the society mm. and i had to be a bit more focused in what i was doing with yeah. stuff I, I, rather little, than just enjoy a little less there. dramatic <laughs> and get on, get on with the job girl get on with the job of but, actually making a proper card index catalogue of mm. what was in the documents, what deeds were in there, what the date was, who the main parties in the um, it mentioned in the deeds were and and and, and So what else was in there? You got the title deeds, what other we've documents got, we, here? We've got the title deeds. The, I suppose probably the real treasure um, of the, of the society, the most treasured possessions were, were also two enormous large bound ledgers that contained over 200 plans of and ballot notices 
of the plans that the society had developed in many parts of Suffolk, basically, by the Freehold Land Society between 1850 and the 1930s. So we're looking at estates in Ipswich, in Felixstowe, in Framlingham, Lowestoft, Hadley. Those ledgers are now in a very fragile state, and although they're held at Suffolk Archives, we've actually, some, some years ago, we realised how important it was to have access to those, and we've and got... were they in a good state? Were they they'd been stored at Stored they're, Archive? They're, they're, they're not too bad. The mm. point about the basement was mm. that it had very, very thick walls, so the temperature was very constant, mm. and it was dry. And so dark. And, and dark. Yeah. Um, and and so, the, apart from the fact that they shouldn't have been in tin trunks, they should have been uh, acid-free paper, which I've spent the last 30 years re-wrapping stuff. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, they, they, are, they are really, you know, well looked after, and they've now been transferred to Suffolk Archives. So, so what, a lot of that would have been handwritten as well, wouldn't it? They're all handwritten. All handwritten? Yeah. Yeah, we we have minute books. We've got over fifty minute books going back to eighteen sixty nine, all hand, all hand. And that would be an specialist job writing then. No, it would be it, just everybody it, wouldn't be it, be a scribe. No, no. Um, I, yeah, I think it was a you know. I mean, my it was a my handwriting job. would have been any good in there. No, you needed yeah, well, well, no. the, the handwriting varies in minute books, but <laughs> they're they're mostly very very good. And what is really nice is that uh, that they're indexed. Somebody actually went through, and there's a physical index in the front. Um, and so if you're looking for something in um, Felixstowe, you can look up all of the page numbers that have got a reference to something that was happening in Felixstowe that the society was doing in And look at this social history we've got here, isn't it? I mean, we could easily... I mean, we think of building societies, as I say, we think of money. We could easily let this drift away. <laughs> but... A good marketeer will, will, will make use of this. It, it, it is gold, mm. gold that you've got here. Well, absolutely, yeah. The, 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 the roots that um, this brand has, I think, are absolutely remarkable. And it, is, it does still start to build a, a, a tapestry of social history of, of, of Suffolk. And, um, I mean, we were talking about the title deeds, yeah. going back to Tudor times, and you can start to see what, what land was used for over time. Um, and then we bring it up to... Felixstowe, just for argument's sake, and, and we're looking at the estates that we built in Felixstowe, um, and, and you, you can start to build this really, really interesting picture of, 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 of how of how people lived. You know? And it wasn't just on plots, it was like huge swathes of Felixstowe that uh, yeah. were built by uh, Freehold Land Society at the time, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, it, I'm yeah, trying, yeah to, I'm it trying to get the chronolo yeah, chronologically that, right, that, so that, it was there. Yeah, it, was the, it was the Freehold Land Society, and so if you wander around Felixstowe today, yeah. if you see the initials on one of those house plaques... It's funny, because I've, I've, you, you showed me that. I've seen on the house plaques, it, it says, uh, like, Marlborough Terrace, and it's got That's 1840... Right. Well, mm -hmm. But yeah. it's got F... L S. I never knew what that meant. No, no. I thought I thought it was maybe the builder or something. Yes. But that is well, in a sense, it was the builder, but it stands for Freehold Land Society rather than somebody's name. And is, is there? A, um, I'm getting really curious now. Is, has there someone <laughs> gone round taking photographs of what what there yeah, still is? Yeah, yeah. Well, we've done a certain amount, okay. but we know what what. Uh, what was done would, yeah. simply because of the plans and the ballot notices yeah. and the point about the ballot notices is that there's a wealth of detail it doesn't just tell you how much the houses were going to cost you or what the mortgage repayments were going to be but it gives you details a bit like an estate agent's mm. um, thing will tell you about the local area the facilities what employment there is locally transport services so for example in July 1885 um, we were building some houses in, in Montague Road and Cobbold Road in Felixstowe, large houses, and it actually says the water was laid on by the Felixstowe Company. So already we've got, yeah. we know about the Felixstowe Water Company. It's going to overlap everywhere. Mm. Um, yeah. And, and, th and those houses yeah. are there today, so people living in there, they might yeah. have no knowledge of this no, at all. No, no. And you, they're, they're yeah. sleeping in the rooms, they're cooking in those, in those kitchens where the uh, first yeah. people did it. Yeah, it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's, a, the, that's a responsibility, isn't it? it? Yeah, yeah, it is. And I think a lot of people who are renovating property now yeah. are very interested in the detail mm. because we can say exactly we've got mm. um, ballot notices with 
with drawings, architect's drawings of what the front looked like, so you can tell mm. from that exactly, and and it describes how many rooms there are and how many. So if floors. someone was trying to put their property back, I mean, we we yeah. put in loads of PVC windows, and that some of these buildings yeah. are. Um, you, you must shock, but yeah. if they want so people come want to see how the house originally was, they can yeah. get it. They can. They can. Yeah. We've got they, technology they, to take it back. Yeah, they've got very very good idea. We have a few, not many, but we have a few actual architect specifications for the houses that we were going to build. So we'd we'd employ an architect to draw up an estate plan, write up a specification. That specification would be sent to local builders, who then um, put in a price, a tender price for building the house on behalf of the committee um, and they they were very very keen that these should be really top quality um, well So if you were tendering for houses. it, you knew if you were tendering for Freehold Land yeah. Society you had to be good You did. They and were they were yeah. tough bosses Yeah, yeah, and and they checked they didn't just rely on the builder mm. doing what he he was supposed to so be doing. So it really was the good the old days. We, we hark back and we say it's, uh, it wasn't like, it's yeah. not like today. Look, no. let, let's take take you back a bit now, the difference between a bank and a building society, yeah. because um, nowadays they blend in. Then they it was do. completely different, wasn't it? Yeah, you're right, and I think it's really interesting. When we've done a lot of focus groups and we've spoken to, to members and non-members and um, in my marketing role, uh, it's interesting that younger people don't, get it they don't understand people in their 20s and even 30s don't generally understand the difference between a bank and a building society older people do they get this feeling of mutuality and the fact that um the the building society is there um for for, for, for members mutual benefit um i mean quite simply the way i'd put it is that a bank tends to have shareholders mm. and those shareholders obviously need a profit to see a profit at the end of the day because mm. you want to dish that profit out and share it around your shareholders um we, as an independent building society, don't have shareholders. Um, we, of course, have our members and everyone who is saving with us and, and, and we're lending out uh, mortgages to. Um, but what it means is that our profits can be used not just for uh, to obviously sustain the building society, we obviously need to keep the business going, uh, but it's also um, our profits are also used for uh, the community. And over the years, um, we talk about you know the, the roots of the building society and what, what we were founded for. Um, and of course, to, to a degree that that still all rings true. Um, you know, we, we were making safe homes for people uh, in, in in the mid 18th century into into the uh, sorry 1800s into the into the um, into the early 20th century. And now what we're doing is we're we're also making safe homes in a different sense. So we um, we'll come to this in a moment. But we have our, um, our our strategic charities as we call them, and they're our partners. But this isn't new. This has been going on since the beginning, isn't it? People think, <laughs> yeah. oh, you're doing all this in society, but there's nothing new about this. This no, is no, this no. is what and people don't realise it. Well, we've long supported charities yeah. for years and years and years. And what we've started to do now is is um, we, we've got a partnership with um, Suffolk Wildlife Trust. And what we want to do there is obviously make safe homes for nature mm. locally. Mm. Uh, and uh, we've also got partnerships with people like Ipswich Housing, Housing Action Group and mm. Emmaus Suffolk, um, who are all about um, safe homes for people who are vulnerable uh, and at risk of, uh, of homelessness or uh, are vulnerable in other ways. Uh, and also the, uh, the 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 lighthouse women's refuge as well for people who are who are at threat of domestic violence. So uh, that's obviously women and, and children. And as shareholders well. of banks get uh, uh, get their rewards on the shares, but, but you also give dividends, so members can get dividends as well. Is that right? Well, no. So what what you have is obviously we have the interest rates that yep. we set for savers. Uh, there's no dividend to such. Okay. But you, we have the interest rates that we set for savers, and uh, and and that's how you you you. Uh, profit I've got it. Way, I've got sense. it. I've got my terms wrong. I've got that then. No, that's fine. Let's have a, a break for some more music. Uh, Beatles next. I'd love this. You've got you've got a big wide choice of music, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've got an eclectic eclectic choice. But someone, can we say you've got a bit of link with Phoenix Do Radio as well? Because um, uh, you've got family in Phoenix Do Radio. I do. My father-in-law is none other than Roger the, Pettit. The Roger. Roger Pettit, the roots and shoots Roger Pettit, who's at this moment very blushing, but a, a, gra a great programme. So, is music part of your life, big part? Yeah, huge part. That's something that Margaret, you and she music? Not particularly. Oh, good. Well, well you, you just sit there and have a drink. That's, that's, we'll, that's we'll, we'll carry on. But, um, well, I've got to ask you, how, how do you listen to music? I mean, we're just going off track for a moment. We've got a, a boys talk. How do you listen to your music? On radio, on, on CD, download? What do you do? Um, I've got... I've got 
vinyl because I yep. listen to a lot of vinyl. Mm. Um, I used to have a thousand CDs, which I slimmed down to about three hundred, mm. and then I do stream how, as how well. How do you get rid of them? Cause I've got CD, I've got that many. Got CDs. I can't get rid of any of them. <laughs> so I went. I, I had to develop rules. So what I decided to do was I went for complete dis- studio discographies. Mm. So um, I've got all of my Kinks, all of my Beatles, all of my Prince, mm. uh, all of my Beach Boys, mm. and, and that's how I decided to do it. So I thought if I've got a complete discography of someone, I'll keep those CDs. If they're just random albums here and there, then I'll, I'll get rid of them. OK, so you've, you've almost become an archivist yourself. <laughs> In a sense, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> have you got a carding index? <laughs> no, not quite, but I do have a spreadsheet, so I suppose that's the problem I'm doing. It. You like your spreadsheets, don't you? You're really good. Anyway... Um, um, and we're talking to, to Luke, Little Boy and Margaret Hancock about Suffolk Bill Society and you've chosen Beatles now. Yeah, Can't Buy Me Love. I want to have a good old look back into history today and into the future. It's a two-hour programme talking about Suffolk Building Society as it now is. With me is the head of marketing, Luke, Little Boy and Margaret Hancock, who's the archivist for society. Now, when I was going through your notes, one thing came up. It's, always, I've, I've, it's one of those things I've always seen and I've never asked a question. Going through Ipswich, and you've got a district called California. Now, yeah. wha- ha- that's all your fault as well, isn't yeah. it? It's you, Margaret. You, it was you. Not me personally. I wasn't around in 1849, <laughs> but, but that's from, that's come from... I, I didn't, um, this is going to yeah. really educate it's, me now, because I never knew that. No. Um, well... As you know, the, the society began in 1849 uh, with its first meeting in December 1849, and it kept in, and it started to collect money from ordinary working people, and it slowly accumulated enough cash to consider buying its first estate that they were going to divide it up and and the estate they bought was part of what was then called the Caldwell Hall estate Mm -hmm. on the east side of Ipswich um, somewhere around Cottleston School for anybody who knows that area at all um, at the time and they bought 98 acres of land so what, that was there. just open land then at the it time was, it was farmland farm and land. they were quite criticised for the fact that it was then considered to be a long way from the town centre well that would never happen <laughs> today criticising so, building areas so, would it? that wouldn't happen today yeah, so but they, it was farmland then but it was, it was farmland then and they basically divided it into 282 plots mm. of land mm. that were just big enough to qualify for so these should all be all equal plan, plots. E- all, equal, yeah. all equally sized plots, yeah. just big enough to qualify for the 40 shilling franchise mm-hmm. that um, Luke was talking about earlier. Um, and the, the, the reason it was called... Um, it happened in 1850, and the reason, of course, that it was called California became known as California because 1849, if you remember your history, was the year of the Californian gold rush. Mm. And so there is a legend, and I'm sure it's only a legend. No, that, it's true. That, <laughs> it's, got, that, it's got to be true. It's that, such a fabulous story. It's got to be true. That, that, that one of the members, most of the members, just kept it as a, a, a mm. market garden yeah. and to get to qualify for yeah. the vote. Um, one or two who were better off did actually build houses, and some of those houses are still standing. Mm. They're, they're recognised because they're built of flint, because at the time there was a tax on bricks. So if you wanted to build, you oh, built with oh, you built. I with love flint. this woman, Luke. She's coming out with all these stories. I mean, you, you, we're going to be looking at houses completely different now, aren't we? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah I think you will. You can always yeah. tell a freehold land society estate mm. because. There, a, a lot of the plots are still there, mm. but they were, by by today's standards, they were considerably sized plots, mm. and so you get a lot of infilling mm. later infilling between original, um, you know, amongst the original original plots. So. Um, it, the, the 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 legend goes that someone was digging his plot of land. Mm. <coughs> And a, and a gentleman rode up on a horse from Ipswich and said, what are you doing, my man? And he said, I'm digging for gold like they do in California. <laughs> that is now That's... Margaret's law. That is... <laughs> Not true. I will, I will, I will joust, I will, I will duel with anyone to death because that is a true I... story. No, I don't think... No, it is. <laughs> Luke Teller, it's the truth, isn't it, now? We've got to stick by it. And, and, and what is interesting is that... Um, 
we've actually got probably three estates mm. in different parts of the country that were very early freehold yeah. land society, or county, I should say, um, that were very early freehold land society. You may be familiar with Woodbridge on the outskirts tell opposite my, the tell, tell, York, tell me more. California. Oh, that's California as well. California. Of it's a freehold. It's an estate that was developed by the Freehold Land Society okay, as yeah. land. You and, know, I, I knew them yeah. both, but I didn't. I, I, no. I didn't it, think. Yeah, I mean, no. a, a lot of the street names in yeah. Ipswich, you'll, you'll, you'll yeah. see, like Benazet yeah. Street or, or whatever, yeah. mm. and you yeah. won't take it back to its history. But it's when you go into the history, yeah, it's yeah. fabulous. Phoenix 02, with all, all the names yeah. in the street names. You like Benazet Street, yeah. because there's a connection with the Freehold Land Society. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> he <set us> up. <laughs> well, our very first president was a chap called Richard Dykes Alexander, yeah. um, who was a Quaker banker, mm. and he was very, very keen on health helping ordinary working people mm. and before he got involved with the Freehold Land Society he'd been actually been one of the prime movers in the anti-slavery movement mm. um, and campaigning to have the slavery abolished and so when his land attached to his house in Ipswich which is on the west side of Ipswich over near Coes if I'm allowed Bramford to Road, say right, that yeah. you, can say um, you say Coes twice if you want we love Coes they can come and advertise with us Coes can't they <laughs> so when his they have sales at Coes as well. <laughs> sorry go on when his land was developed the streets were actually named after people who were involved in the uh, Clarkson Street Clarkson uh, Street Benazette Street, Benazette Benazette Street. Well, well I know they're, that. yeah they're all they're all there. That, that, yeah. that, that, quit. That's I why digress. I, that's sorry. Why, no, that's why I could never do your job because I would digress and then digress from a digression because yeah. you'd find more. But you, you yeah. put, it, put it back again. Yeah. Uh, um, you mentioned Quakers at the time because uh, we uh-huh. think of Cadbury's and Port mm. Sunlight. Yeah. It, yeah, was, really it was very much, wasn't it, mm. what yeah. people were doing? Mm. Absolutely, it was. Yeah, mm. and yeah. Uh, I, I suppose uh, pre-welfare state, etc. It was. It was a lot mm. of people like that that sort of had to step up and. Yeah. Um, give back in some way yeah but very wise businessmen because mm. they knew they were invested in the families and, and the right. people it wasn't just it was it was benevolence mm. but it was that they get the best out of the yeah. workers as well yeah, so yeah, it yeah. was very clever true business yeah get something back definitely yeah, <laughs> right we've got two californians and a benazette what, <laughs> what else have you got right. um, what other uh, take us further around suffolk where you're working right. because it, it uh, people known you for a long time as the Ipswich right. Building Society. It's yeah. very much Suffolk, so... Yeah, yeah. actually, we only took on the name Ipswich Building Society in the 1970s. Up until then, we were the freehold... It's the Strange. Ipswich and Suffolk Freehold Land Society. And, and certainly when I first started, mm. there were members who who would st- older members who would still say they were they were members of the freehold mm. they didn't refer to we it. don't we don't like change no. do we well that, that was uh, what's yeah. really interesting for me that was a merger wasn't it with um yeah. uh, Ipswich and district Ipswich and district yeah. who, yeah. who um oh, that branch was on it was from, on northgate street yeah, yeah. yeah. on northgate yeah. street and um it was part of the deal yeah. that, with them that we that we, dropped that the Suffolk. we agreed we'd drop the suffer yeah. and i think what this is the marketing man coming out of me now um because i mean i love ipswich building society is the old name since the 70s of course i do because Mm -hmm. that's the one i was familiar with as a young child as well but um the idea of obviously being the suffolk which is obviously kind of what we were you know (laughs) over 170 years ago Mm -hmm. is of course you can appeal to people across the county and also beyond you know we do have members in north essex Mm. and into cambridgeshire well you, you, you take something like the woolwich that was mm. that started the same way and became a, a national name. Now so Suffolk is another national name. Exactly. It, yeah. we, we we can say hang on to sentiments, but the the people who started this, they were ready for change all the way. So they they'd have changed with yeah. it. We can't say oh, we should never have done. Change happens, doesn't it? No, mm. no it does. You were talk, talking about infill as well. People, oh, it should oh. never happen. But no. the, the the forefathers would have would have approved of that. That's it, and I think, and I think it was important for us from from the outset that we were a, a county wide organisation. The Ipswich and Suffolk was a very specific thing. So, okay, in the eighteen fifties, we had these estates from Shotley to Walton, Harwich to Dovercourt, and Melton. Um, we had six estates at Lowestoft in eighteen in the eighteen sixties. And three at Framlingham in the 1870s. So we were and working. And it was it's the, a big area, but yeah. the transport wasn't good then. So it, no. it was a very big company. Yeah. Mm. yeah, yeah, it was. I mean, there's a. I, I've got one of the one of the quirky things we have in the archive is a is a a, a bill for a dinner 
at the Crown Hotel at Framlingham, mm. which basically was one of the committee members who'd been deputised by the rep by the board to go and and uh, to an auction in Framlingham um, to bid for plots of land that were coming up in in Framlingham on the broad what was a Broadwater Estate in Framlingham. Okay. Um, and. So they obviously travelled over there, probably by train, because I think it was connected by train then, um, mm -hmm. and and had dinner at the at the um, Crown while they were there, putting in a bid for the for the for the land that they were going to buy to develop the one of the Freehold Land Society estates at Framlingham. We're coming up to the news, but wasn't Langer Road also from? The I've got the name right. Uh, Free Old Land Society, Langer Road in Phoenixdale. Uh, that we did certainly. We had some land in yeah. that we balloted as late as the 1930s because we were our our final estates were mm. um, end of the 1930s really when we when we stopped um, balloting land and and building houses then. Um, so yeah. Um, and, and as you know, we were heavily involved in the growth of Felixdale. Got over over Massively. a period of ten years. Can, yeah. Well, we'll do more in the yep. second hour. But okay. can we can we come back another time and do a Felixdale yeah. special? Can I can I borrow her for another time? <laughs> of course. I, 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 of course. It, it's the stories. I, I love the stories about Felixdale. And I want to look around. I want I want you to give me some tips around Felixdale. So we go around and look at some of these houses and look mm. up at, at, mm. at the at the mm. at the flint on some places or the names yeah. on there. It's mm. Really good yeah. stuff. OK, uh, you two have a quick break. We'll be back in a moment. We're having uh, news coming up in a moment. You're listening to Felix Doe Radio, 107.5 FM and online. And until one o'clock today, we're talking all about Ipswich Building Society. I have learned so much. And I'm, I'm quite envious of Margaret's job. She is archivist for society. It's her job to go with a very logical mind through all these th archives. And she's come with so much paper and Fox and we've only just touched the service. Luke is the head of marketing and he's um, he's talking about bringing it through from all the different brands to the brand we've got today, the Suffolk Building Society, serving the county and the country. It's Phoenix Doe Radio 107.5 FM. That's uh, home and uh, your choice, that one. Uh, good good one, for, uh, choice for someone in a building society home. Have you, have you themed all the music? Right? I have tried to put a loose theme around everything. There's money, there's building homes, there's <laughs> sort of revolution mm. in the air, you know, all, all, all that kind of thing. Uh, can I make a confession? Mm. When I nipped out quickly, I left my mic open. Everybody knows where I've been to now, so... <laughs> <laughs> the shows is live radio. We're talking to Luke Littleboy, uh, head of marketing, and Margaret uh, uh, Hancock is the archivist for Suffolk Building Society. Now, Margaret, we were talking early on about building the houses. Yeah. The let me get this term right. The yep. land society were very particular. It had to be quality, it, didn't it? It did. I mean, um, it was. It, it really was the best quality. Yeah. It was. It was absolutely the best quality, which is why they've they've all been. Uh, so many of them are still standing, including mm. the very first ones that we built in Ipswich in 1866. So they're still providing homes mm. in Lancaster Road, just off St Helen Street. Um, I'm and to, oh, I'm we, sure it's, I know. No, yeah, Lancaster. It, it runs between Warwick Road and... Oh, Lanc yes, yes, yeah. yes, I've got you. Uh, yeah. Um, but but they're still there, 24. They were, they, they were actually... They were described in a in a national sort of land agents magazine at the time. These um, houses in Lancaster Road as as being pretty and substantial six room cottages. Mm -hmm. Each cottage had five rods of ground, so about half the size of an allotment, and they were sold by ballot for one hundred and forty five pounds each. Again, the garden would be important because people yeah, would have been growing that's that. Right. It, it wouldn't have been yeah. a pretty garden. It wouldn't. It wasn't yeah. like a town garden nowadays. That no. would have been for for crops yeah, and for it, fruit and veg. Yeah, yeah, it would have been. And in fact, later on, after the First World War, when there was a terrible shortage of housing, mm. the society actually. Um, convert it sounds awful now they converted some former army huts mm. into bungalows that were put on land in Brantford Lane in Ipswich actually for their members they were the first 
houses that we balloted after the fir- after the end of the First World War, okay. and they actually had. Um, they planted the fruit trees in the, in the gardens, ready for the members who were going to take those over. And and then the member not only, particularly if they came back from the First World War with some sort of disability, mm. they would um, they could operate as a small market gardener. At the time so, when women were becoming more important, and women would have been doing the less traditional yeah. jobs for women as well. Uh, so they they'd yeah. be they'd have been doing the gardening they, and stuff, yeah, the growing in the war. I say gardening. gardening; it wasn't gardening, was it? <laughs> no. it was growing. It it was it was growing, growing. Yeah. yeah yeah it was but the quality was was really um absolutely crucial as i said earlier we've got some specific architect specifications mm. and um i thought you might be interested in the wording on some of that because mm. we were paying great attention to the quality of materials and workmanship so for in 1912 there's a specification for houses in um off the norwich road in ipswich which stipulated that the plasterer had to have hair mortar that had one pound of well-beaten cow hair to every cubic fit, foot of mortar so it was cow hair plaster that was going on the slater had to cover the roofs with best welsh slates equal to a sample that was supplied by the committee so no buying a cheaper one when the committee aren't looking well, why um, aren't why aren't we doing that now with haste <laughs> it's probably the expense I now know. i mean there's probably someone with a really logical answer but, yeah, but I, want, that, I want to be illogical for a minute and, and they were also very keen on the external appearance mm. of the of the property so those same houses the 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 instruction was to pave the porches and front paths with four-inch black and white quarry tiles, but they had to be laid diagonally, which sort of attracts you up the front path. You see some of those paths nowadays, don't you? And they they are going to rack and ruin, but uh, reclamation yards are doing fortunes on those things. Oh, they are, yeah. It is, but it it was giving people uh, the pride Pride. and and dignity. Mm. Yeah, And, and also they proved to be exceedingly popular in terms of the number of members who wanted the opportunity to go in the ballot and the chance to buy um, some of those houses. So, for example, coming back to Felixstowe, for example, the nine houses in Felixstowe balloted in 1885, there were 400 applications from Mm. members for those nine houses. And it's I find that particularly interesting that time because five of the of the successful members to get the right to buy one mm. of those were female members. And I think this was just after the Married Women's Property Act came mm. in. And they were large houses deliberately designed so that women particularly could set up as lodging housekeepers at a time when... When Felix Stowe was a growing seaside enormous resort. social history you've got there, yeah. isn't it? It, did, yeah, it, it, it must is. surprise you. I mean, you, you're, you're used to these stories, but every time you come across yeah. one, you must feel really yeah. proud of it. It, it. it it's a very interesting thing. Every time I I I'm allowed mm. to go off and delve deeper mm. in and tell a story about a particular area. Um, there, there is something that comes up that I wasn't aware, aware of before. I, you know, um, when, even during lockdown, when I was working from home, looking in much more detail at our ballot notices and the information that was there, um, w- was absolutely fascinating in terms of the detail that is put on it. You know, some mm. land, and we were talking about Langer Road earlier on, mm. Um, some land in in Langer Road was actually described as being six minutes walk away from the beach, the original beach station. Mm -hmm. And that, of course, provided transport, not just into Ipswich, but all the way through to London. Look, as we've been saying, the society in all its formats is providing more than housing. It's providing social life. It's, it's It's giving people a step up, isn't it? Yeah, it is giving people a step up. It's worth keeping in mind, actually, as well, that um, a lot of these houses, they were they were well built, they were well put together, uh, and then when they were built, they were only only had a small working profit as well. Very so, small. So very small yeah. working profit. <laughs> well, so the, the, these were homes yeah. that were built. Um, I suppose these days you'd have housing associations and that kind of thing, mm-hmm. but it really, really sort of predated that. But, yes, it did give people a, a step up. You're mm-hmm. right. Mm, and with the guards yeah. and thinking ahead, not just there's your house, off off you go, yeah. and then thinking about the rest of society in in a broader broader uh, way. Mm-hmm. Let's just go. Can we talk about the 
the a- AGMs, because some you get a <laughs> smile on your face. And the AGMs, obviously, this because it was the people are members, aren't they? Yeah. So everyone had a right to attend, was it? Yep. So yes. Uh, well, the, Margaret's got some awesome stories, which we'll, we'll get into in a second. I think so. We've just had our AGM for this year. It was mm. on the on the twenty second of March, and um, uh, it was Dr. Amir Khan, uh, who was our keynote speaker, if you like, our guest speaker, and he was he was absolutely fascinating. He spoke a lot there about. Uh, um, uh, the importance of nature on health and well-being, um, and some people might be familiar with him as um, uh, Channel 5's GPs behind closed doors, and I think he's been on this morning and, and, and that kind of thing. He was a really great speaker, but I think that we do have good speakers. We can talk about some others in a moment, and, and, and Margaret's got some fascinating um, old stories about the AGMs. But I think the most important thing about the AGMs, this is going to sound a bit silly me saying this, is that we have them. <laughs> uh, because if you think about it, I was saying we're still member owned. We don't have shareholders. Uh, really, our members hold us to account, if you like. The fact that we make them member events for members to come and attend, for members to, to, to you still get a vote. You still get a vote in how the societies run. You still get to vote on things like if we're appointing someone to the board and who our auditors are and various things that you do get to have a vote on. Even when we changed our name from Ipswich Building Society to Suffolk Building Society, there was a special resolution and we mm. put that to member vote. It was well over 97% or something that people that voted in favour of it. So um, I think the fact is, you know, a lot of people sort of say, well, that's all very well and good, you know, why, why should I bother getting involved? I think the most important thing is that we ask, we ask. <laughs> and, people, and people do bother. Yeah, they do bother. Yeah, we, we're very, very well attended. Um, I don't want to mention any names. I don't, I don't want to uh, cause controversy. But compared to um, other building societies uh, these days, we, we are very well attended in terms of our membership coming out. Um, and, uh, you know, having it's actually a great opportunity. And this is the marketing me coming out as well. Mm. It's a great opportunity just to speak to members about, you know, what's important to them or what you what resonated with them in, in the messaging we were putting out so that you, year. Do you, do you get time, it's like conferences, do you get time away from the, the, the main speech to hear what people are saying? Do they come up and say, hey, I like this, or have you thought of that? I mean, is it that's... Is that communication so good? Yes, and, and uh, members, and I, I, I mean this with all the love in my heart, members are very vocal and they will tell you very quickly, you know, if they do like <laughs> yeah, something yeah. or don't like something or if there's an idea for the future or, 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 or what, what they especially, think you should be doing. Especially Suffolk people. They are, they are, they are quite <laughs> direct, aren't they? I mean, you're, I know you're not just based in Suffolk, you've got members all over the country, but Suffolk people are, are quite direct with what they want. And yes, they're, they're, yes, they're, they are. And so they should be. And yeah, and, and as a Suffolk person of many generations, I feel, I feel I'm okay to say that, yes. Mm. Well, I'm okay to say it because... <laughs> I, I, I get slated anyway, whatever I say. So, Margaret, t- <laughs> tell me through some of the some of the quirky AGMs then you've oh, had. Well, you were, you were saying about um, you know the members are entitled to come and entitled to vote. One of the one of the strangest um, occurrences from historical meetings probably was um, when the society needed a new solicitor in 1890. Um, having had the, its original solicitor, a, a lovely chap by the name of Woodruff Daniel. I always love That's that name. That's a good name, isn't it? Yeah. Um, he died, but he'd held the post since the formation of the society in 1849, so it was 41 years. <sighs> and so a bit like when Queen Victoria died and nobody could remember how to organise a funeral, um, somebody had to go down the rules of, from 1849 and... and, and see what we needed to do in order to elect a new mm. a new solicitor um and apparently it was supposed to be done by a show of hands um of members at the AGM but this is um getting a bit more difficult by 1890 because we'd actually got more than 5000 members who were all entitled to show their hands and vote for the vote for the new solicitor um and the only place that was um the only hall that was big enough to actually hold the number of members who were likely to come at the time was the Corn Exchange in in the middle of Ipswich. Um, and there were th- originally there were three contenders. Um, one of them eventually was, was discounted because he'd only got about seven um, people who were interested. But the other two were quite fiercely... 
political oh, rivals wouldn't apart you love to travel from back? Wouldn't else? you love to travel back and hear, hear them? I mean, if we had a TARDIS today, yeah. I'd take you back there. Yeah. We could just sit, get you, yeah. can, you can hear the hustle and the bustle, can't you? So the only so they were they were very competitive, and in fact they 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 offered some members sort of free train tickets from Felixstowe if they were coming in from Felixstowe to come into the Cornish so Game Unit so then. they could so they could yeah. so they could get the vote, um, and. They 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 decided that a show of hands wasn't going to decide it, so they set up two turnstiles at the exit to the mm. to the corn exchange, and they labelled with the two names <laughs> remaining names, and yeah. the members had to leave the the hall um, through the the turnstile yeah. to record their vote. Well, bear in mind it was January and it was very very cold outside. Yeah. They had to wait outside until everybody had passed through, which took about forty minutes. Yeah before they could come back in and hear what the what the result was. Um, but eventually it turned out to be um, E.P. Ridley of, of a firm that was then called Burkett, Ridley and Bartley. And Burkett's, I think, are still the society still going. Yeah, much going today. Today. See, yeah. you take me down another yeah. route then. I was in the war about the solicitors. and uh, yeah. But that, the turnstile thing, that reminds me of uh, voting in the House of Commons. You yeah. go through a lobby. Yeah, you do. It's very clear. And, uh, yeah. of course, there'd, there'd, there'd have been no no even thought of corruption. It, it wouldn't. It would no. have been... Honest and fair, you'd have trusted <clears throat> it completely, wouldn't mm, you? Absolutely, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, it had to be. People were sort of clambering over one another to get back in, over weren't the they? Because it was, so, so it was cold, yeah. Mm. <laughs> Maybe they should have yeah. done it the other way and put them outside and come yeah. and vote in, they'd have got it over very quickly then. Yeah. <laughs> that, that is a fascinating <laughs> story. But, yeah, you, ma- you imagine that, a solicitor for 40 mm. years, he would know it inside out. He wouldn't yeah. even need any books or manuals. He'd just know so. what the society did. Well, mm. you think that's for- that's good. We've actually you're gonna, got you're a, gonna beat that one. a father and a father and son, the Pierce father and son, um, Joseph and Arthur, between them were secretaries to the society for the first 65 years oh. between them. Wow. So if you know Ipswich at all, yeah. like off Felixstowe Road, you've got a Pierce Road down P- near Derby Road, Road, yeah, Road yeah, Railway yeah. Station. Uh, it's where the nursing home is, isn't it? No, it's Pearson, no, that's Pearson no, Road. Pearson. Yeah, yeah. It's under Pearson Road. Yeah, yes, it's, yes, it's sure. just at the back of um, yeah. what is now Derby Road Station. Yeah. Um, and and so that's in honour of, of Joseph Pierce, the first secretary who died shortly before the Freehold Land Society developed that estate in the in the eighteen eighties and so the street was named after after him. And our meeting houses at the Mutual House of Town Centre branch are actually named Pierce and Ridley mm. in in honour of those very early connections. People yeah. who gave up a tremendous amount of their time. Lots of important families in, in Phoenix <laughs> uh, in Ipswich mm. and, and Suffolk at the time. Yeah. Big influential yeah. not just in our area but nationally. Yeah. I think one of the interesting points about the AGM as well is that um, we talk about being sort of ahead of the time and this kind of thing. You know, female members could vote yeah. in, in, in these oh, b- yeah. b- prior to, obviously, in a general election, you wouldn't necessarily be able to speak. I wonder how that, uh, how that felt for the women. I mean, it must be. Uh, and what did the, how did the men react? Because, I mean, we see mm. it nowadays, even with golf clubs still, not many, but yeah. still women aren't allowed. But then that is. That was, enormously forward thinking yeah it yeah it is and it, it still it still surprises me when i see you know mortgages mm. made out to women you know dating from the 1890s mm. um and it's and it's and it's women not always of, of independent means mm. either you know they might even have had some you know they might have been um teachers or or have some other sort of profession and but they were entitled to vote and they had an interest well in, that was the whole ethos wasn't it the, it was for yeah. everybody it yeah. was, it's uh, universal absolutely okay we'll have a break and some music what we're going to be playing next uh, you've chosen the young bloods the young bloods yeah so we're talking about the agm and uh, this song's all about kind of getting together and making change happen okay we'll have a break and we'll be straight back you're listening to Felix Stowe Radio on 107.5 FM. And until one o'clock and Pete Seven takes over, we're talking still to um, Luke and Margaret from Suffolk Build Society. Luke is the head of marketing. Margaret is the archivist and a lot more. And story, a storyteller as well, aren't you? I mean, you you, you don't just... You, you go a little archi- archives and a little bit more, yeah. don't you? Well, it's just 30 years of looking at the archives. A, cu- a curiosity. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but you've got yeah. a discipline to know where to stop, haven't you? Yeah. you don't go down rabbit holes and keep no. exploring exploring look let's talk about the building society
variety today because mm-hmm. it is um, it's a lot bigger and mm-hmm. it's different, but it's 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 the same principles from the day one since the eighteen hundreds. Yes, it is. Um, it's interesting, really. So, in terms of what we um, do, we we don't build houses anymore. But we what we do do is we we ha- we encourage safe homes. Um, so. I spoke uh, a little bit of, uh, of time ago about the, the, the charities we've helped over the years, and, and that was always has been going very well, and, and, and we've helped some very worthwhile charities uh, over the decades. Um, but what we wanted to do um, when we rebranded to Suffolk Building Society was was grow the society. We wanted to appeal to people um, slightly from outside of the Suffolk borders uh, as well, and that's something that's, that's happening and is growing. Um, and, of course, what we want, wanted to do was... Um, come up with a kind of co- more coordinated and impactful way of of of, of, of making positive change uh, for the for the people of Suffolk so the communities that we serve we, we wanted to make a, a really positive change for them so we've launched two campaigns um, recently there's the saving Suffolk campaign and there's the safe homes for Suffolk campaign and um, basically what this means is over the next three years we're going to be giving more than one hundred thousand pounds to address two social issues which is safe homes and protecting nature that we feel are, A, true to our roots, and B, really, really important for people. What we actually did was we asked people, which is I I mentioned earlier about speaking to members and AGM. Mm. That's the best feedback you'll ever get. And that's what we did this time as well. We we did a a few surveys and and focus groups, and we really wanted to find out what what the issues were that that mattered most to people. So if I talk about saving Suffolk just for a moment, um, that's really to do with our partnership that we have with the Suffolk Wildlife Trust. And um, that's all about protecting the county's wild spaces. So most recently, what the Wildlife Trust have done, and you may have heard this on the news and, and elsewhere as well, uh, and through, through the Suffolk Wildlife Trust themselves, is, is they've purchased almost 300 acres of former arable land in Martlesham. It's called Martlesham Wilds. Mm. And they're going to, to wild it. They're going to give it back to nature. And that, that process has just started, really. And um, obviously, as part of our, our campaign, as part of our funding, because like I said, we don't have shareholders, so we don't have to give profits to them. You know, we can, A, keep the society running, because of course we want to do that. But B, we can we can then give it to causes like this. And, and that's something that we've been working on with the Wildlife Trust. If you go to our website, um, and if you follow the links uh, at the bottom through to our YouTube page, or if you just search YouTube for Suffolk uh, Building Society, you'll see on there a video that we've just put out about that uh, Martlesham Wilds piece. Mart- Martlesham is very active in in uh, green issues. The mm. whole whole community, the whole it's a town, isn't it? Our village, village. Uh, I think it's village. Yeah. yeah, yeah. They're they're very active in it. They've got uh, lots of green energy issues going on, and and they're talking about it. And to bring this into there because it's just a fabulous area. It's incredible. Uh, so the Martlesham Wilds themselves are a public right of way. You can go put put your in your sat nav to go to the the church of Martlesham. I think it's St Mary's. There's a car park there. And you can you can walk down through the marsh and wilds. You basically get down to the river Deben, the banks of the Deben. Over the way, you can see Woodbridge, and you can see Sutton Hoo. You know, essentially what becomes Sutton Hoo. And um, it's just the most remarkable, wonderful space already. And that says um, it, was, it was an organic farm, which is obviously good too. What the Wildlife Trust do really well is they work a lot with farmers as well, really closely with farmers, because of course it's not all about just rewilding all of land. You know, you, you, we, we need to produce food as well and sensible <laughs> you know? rewilding that we yeah. don't introduce the wrong thing. It's going to be it's going to be sensitive and uh, appropriate. Yes, in fact, what, one of the things I don't want to speak sort of on behalf of Wildlife Trust because people they're much smarter than me. But what they do is they talk about wilding rather than rewilding. Mm. So what they don't mean is well we're just going to introduce a boar or something and, yeah. and set it free what they do do is they let let it get, go back to nature so um in terms of um a lot of the seeds that are already there they let it kind of spill into the next field it, uh, uh, the, the, they call it the seed bed mm-hmm. so it's all the all the seeds that are naturally there and what you send when you go around and have a walk with them you get a sense of Oh, I can see that kind of wants to be a reed bed, or I can see that that sort of wants to be you know something. You're getting very poetic now, you are. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and, and and if you again, if you go to our website, if you're a member, um, uh, so, so I would urge anyone to to start saving with us, of course. But if you become a member, we have member events, mm. and um, we've just had one for the March and Wilds. It's a guided tour with the uh, Suffolk Wildlife Trust, and we have. Uh, they do the, the, the nature talk because they're far more knowledgeable than I. But what we do is we provide the tea and cake uh, on us. And, um, and uh, yeah, there's a couple more coming up uh, over the course of the year. So if anyone does want a guided tour, then that's something that they could take part in. So that's that's um, that's the Saving Suffolk campaign. But the, but, but the people campaign with Emmaus and IHAG, that is really hard-hitting, isn't it? That is tackling issues. It is. And, and in a certain sense, um, it, the, the, the Saving Nature piece is... is 
it's not, it's not easy to do, but it, it's an easy message mm. because we all like nature. Mm. Uh, you know, it takes a rather cold heart, I think, to, to probably say that you, you, you don't care about nature. I think with um, safe homes for Suffolk, that really is that that piece that's true to our roots, and it's it's like you said, founding fathers or founders. It's that's something that, that that obviously they were interested in this in this moral um, this elevation of people. Now, for lots of different reasons, people can can be vulnerable to um, to homelessness, or they may have come through homelessness, you know, and that they may be um, you know in another phase of their lives. Um, so that's why we've been working really closely with IHAG, which is the Ipswich Housing Action Group, uh, and Emmaus. Um, we're talking about a joint project, um, uh, and, and, and obviously the funding, uh, our funding is there too. Um, but basically, uh, the reason we're working with both of them as well is, is because um, it's that strategic thing. And, and I don't want to sound too corporate when I say this, but of course you don't just want to sort of throw money at a very specific part of the issue. What you want to do is work with people who are very knowledgeable about it, like Ipswich Housing Action Group and MASR, and they're dealing with the issue at, at, at different parts of it, if you like. So Ipswich Housing Action Group may, they have their 6am walks through the, the, the town centre of Ipswich, and, and, and they'll be literally finding people who, um, you know, are, are, are maybe rough sleeping, and um, maybe they just want some warm toast and a mm. chance to wash their clothes that morning. Um, so that's something that they're helping with, amongst many other things. And then what Emmaus do, which I think is remarkable, is uh, and Emmaus Suffolk, is um, they've got places like the Royal Oak now in, in Ipswich, mm. which are now community hubs. And um, a lot of the people there, they're, they're, I suppose you'd call them service units, but they're volunteers. And um, they're actually helping to run the charity as well in terms of... So if you go to that community cafe... There's there's people cooking for you and serving you and and, and they're people that you know have um have uh, have been at that that vulnerable moment themselves in terms of that risk of homelessness etc. So uh, and um and now of course you know they're they're um they're working at a community cafe and, and volunteering and 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 and, and there with the mayor. So Talk, talking of vulnerability, you don't shy away from the tough issues as well. You're working with Lighthouse Women Women's Aid. That is. Well, you can't get enough praise for doing that. It's what a charity that is. Yeah, it's remarkable, and um, they're one of the lesser-known charities. Again, like I said, the Wildlife Trust, you know, very well known. People know what they're about, generally speaking. Lighthouse Women's Aid, maybe one of the lesser-known ones, and um, they support women and children um, who have been at risk of or uh, have been at that end of domestic abuse, um, and uh, they provide uh, refuge for people and you know an opportunity to, to support them so um, again it's this idea of safe homes and, and that's what we wanted to do we wanted to take a step back and think about well why are we here why were we founded what what makes us who we are you know why should people care about Suffolk Building mm. Society anymore when you can just put your money in with a high street bank or, or other lender etc so um, for us it was important to remember why we were here in the first place and that's why these two campaigns around safe homes and uh, for Suffolk and also for uh, for saving Suffolk in terms of nature for us were really really important because that is in my opinion that's what sets us apart from your typical high street bank if you like mm. uh, and you talk about it you communicate it when you first came on on the show today a couple of hours ago we we're talking about when you first went into building society as a young lad you're working with young people as well because it's young people today need education on how to i mean they, they've got different issues completely and mm. young someone now who is uh 15 is a grown-up young people are seven eight need to know now how to manage money and you're helping with that we certainly are yeah so um Again, that dreaded uh, P word of the pandemic, you know, uh, 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 really affected how we were delivering our um, financial education. But we've reinvigorated it. So we're getting into schools. And uh, particularly at the moment, we've been focused on 16, 17 year olds, that sort of age group. So we've been to Farlingay, we've been to Stour Valley High around Sudbury area. Uh, and um, we're going to be doing much more of it as well. And the idea is we get into schools, we get in front of young people and we just talk to them about what money is, if you like, it, and, 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 and the difference between... Um, you know, not all debt is bad. There's good debt. There's bad debt. There's there's a difference between a mortgage and a payday loan. We talk about how to save money, how to budget, how to navigate your first pay slip. You know, this is what tax is and PAYE. Um, and again, when we've been speaking to members, what's really interesting for me is a lot of people in their 20s, when you speak to them, say, man, I really wish we'd had that at school. We, we missed a generation, didn't we? Really? Yeah. Exactly. But when you speak to older people, they go, well, you know, I, I probably don't need that, but it means a lot to me that you do it mm. because 
I've got children or grandchildren, you know, mm. and I, I feel like they need that education. Like I said, my 20s myself were a little bit of a blur, but that grounding that I had, I think, from, from being a part can of we, the Suffolk Society... Can we do a programme about your 20s? <laughs> a late-night programme? I'd, I'd, we'd, we'd listen to that, wouldn't we, Margaret, about, about the blur of the 20s? But again, because uh, um, the world has changed completely. We talk about pe- people in their 40s and 50s. Mm. Their childhood was nothing like it. I mean... Financially, techno- technologically, mm. uh, it's completely different. So you, you look into the young people. And, of course, there'll be people in the future who will be running society as well. Yeah, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. And, and there's so much more for young people to deal with now. Um, obviously, you've got things like social media. But if you're thinking about uh, financial um, um, institutions, if you like, there's a lot of new fintechs and startups. You can invest in cryptocurrency, all those kinds of things. I mean, what we what we do in terms of our products, you know, they're pretty basic. It's savings and it's mortgages. It's, it's a little old fashioned in that sense. But... I do think um, what we do with our financial education is we tell people about the kind of the whole canvas, if you like, of, of, of how to navigate their finances. And, um, and uh, yeah, to us, that's really, really important. Uh, and the history is important because we, we, there's, in a hundred years' time, there'll be another one of you sitting there talking about what we're doing today. And that's why your job's important, isn't it? To keep, keep it uh, locked. That's right. It, it, we, it's why, one of the reasons that we still keep adding stuff to our mm-hmm. archive, you know, from you know, the 1980s, the 1990s, because that's. I, I now work with people who weren't even born in the 1980s. So. Oh, stop it. So, uh, just look this way. I, I, I'll sympathise with you. Yeah. Yeah, so it is important. We, di- we discovered when we celebrated our 150th anniversary back in 1999 mm. that we'd got loads and loads of stuff from the mm. 1850s, 1860s, 1870s. But once you got close, sort of between the Second World War and and 1999 Mm. we were getting a bit thin on the ground Mm. and so there is now an active policy within the society to make sure that we do keep and do people bring stuff to you as well oh Mm. yes that's what i'd like to know someone come with that maybe a passbook or something years ago it's funny we've had um people on social media get in touch with us about uh money boxes from the 70s and uh, we had a recipe book from a primary school recently and uh, there was an advert on the back again this must have been late 70s early 80s of uh, of our old and it was quite funny really because i enthusiastically run through to margaret Margaret, 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 look at this. And this must be from the 80s. <laughs> She's like, what, you mean five, five seconds ago, Luke? <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it's true, though. But, it, yeah. uh, I mean, the, the 80s was a, a big time. Loads to, to remember. People were bringing these things forward. I mean, we're very proud of them. So is, is there any way they can be displayed somewhere? Will they go to a museum or something in the future, maybe? When it comes to actual stuff like yeah. the yeah. like the money boxes yeah. we we've got a certain amount of stuff that we keep within the society so, because obviously Suffolk archives deal particularly with documents yeah. so they're quite happy to have our deeds and our minute books and things um but we but we do and we do put on displays um so in maybe, some maybe of 10 years down the line there'll be room for a, a, a build a Suffolk build society museum we do we do do the heritage. you and i will be in it <laughs> <laughs> we do take part a- annually in the heritage open days yeah. don't we yeah. yeah so we always do something for that mm. when we when we celebrated our 150th mm. We actually had a room at the High Street Museum that is now closed for refurbishment and 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 did a display, complete display, on our first 150 years, as it were. So maybe, you know, 175 years or 200 years. And, and you've we'll, these bad... This, we'll this, this, this the, the, tell people yeah. what these are again, because I've got them in my right. hand. It's, oh, these, these are fabulous. These wooden, these wooden ballot balls, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's... Um, we've, we've got about 6,000 of these. Um, you were saying about coming across things... Um, that I'd not noticed before and I was actually looking through one of our minute books Um, I can't even remember what date it was or what I was actually looking for probably to research a particular area Um, and there was a note in the minute book ordering 3,000 more ballot balls because well our membership numbers had gone up and so we needed 3,000 so we've got trays They're, they're kept in very nice um, wooden cabinets with. Do you know where they came trays. from? Can we find out where they came no, from? No, oh. I've never seen any. Well, well not yet. No, I'm maybe s- someone listening today will say, "Well, my uncle yeah. used to make those, or yeah. my granddad was involved in those." Yeah. And this is another story behind, isn't it? It is. Yeah, yeah. It's. It's. I've. I've got. I've not come across anything. We quite often have 
builders estimates and things like that mm. so we've got some lovely letter headings and of course um, local printers were involved mm. because all of our ballot notices needed to be printed um, East Anglian Daily Times printed some mm. um, independent cows we've got um, various things printed by cows and we've got estimates and quality of paper still in our archive you know about um, estimates for printing 3,000 ballot notices or notices of the AGM so very very wide ranging archives but uh, certainly enough material to put together. Lou what would the founding fathers say today if they could if they could look in today they'd be proud wouldn't they be pretty chuffed don't you think? I'd I'd hope they'd be proud that it's still here I mean so many building societies um, uh, folded and in a sense after they had fulfilled their use you know you would often terminate a building society once um, it bought up a load of land and then a lot plotted it up and sold it on etc etc or had mortgaged it out Um, and uh, in a sense I I like that we're still here today yes we're not building homes in the same way but like I said we're providing hopefully supporting the local community through safe homes whether that's for nature or people who are vulnerable and um, I'd like to think that that those those people that founded us 170 years ago would be proud we're still here and the whole reason we've given it this keen focus I think more recently is because we want to be here for another 170 years Mm. serving the people of Suffolk and, and beyond so yeah hopefully very, very proud our oh, build society we haven't taught money once i think that's glorious don't you <laughs> uh, it's, it's lovely because there is more to building societies than money that we've found that out haven't we we Mu- have much yes. more and, yeah. and i think that's why it's so wonderful to, to be a part of it i really mm. consider myself and i think all of us do really we're kind of caretakers of the brand you know we're mm. here for a little period of time and then we'll obviously be handing it margaret, off. margaret you're yeah. training somebody up to follow you I mean, yeah. Not, well, no. The the staff at the record office obviously have uh, uh, have got have, have now got custody. It's on permanent. I loan. know, but we need someone digging and delving, oh, don't oh, we? We oh, need oh. someone rooting through to find the stories. Well, I mean, the, the, now, fa- the facts are there, but it's the stories that the, I love. The, the 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 main thing is that the very reason that the society decided to deposit the um, information and the archive at the record office is because we were getting an increasing number of calls from independent researchers who were looking into the the history of their house or whatever who wanted to access them and of course with it isn't really possible we're trying to run a business not not you know not a a record office service and that's why the decision was taken that the material should actually go there so it's all available at Suffolk Archives. Thank you for coming today. I need a promise from you that you'll both be back. Please. We certainly will. And definitely yeah. uh, mark some more of your stories yeah. and we'll focus maybe a bit more on Phoenix Stoke because yeah. they're a wealth of history. Sure. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, uh, Pete Seven standing by to take over. I'm back tomorrow morning from 10 with Discoverability. Look forward to it.